Welcome to White Coat Coaching Ortho, the podcast featuring stories from orthopedic surgeons at all levels of practice. Hello, everybody. I'm your host, Emily Tan, and I am so excited to bring you our very first episode. We thought we'd start by introducing you to your white coat coaches. So Andy Malarkey and I sit down and talk about our journeys thus far. Along the way, we talk about all sorts of things, but by the end of this episode, you'll hear about how Andy made the most of his third year being a student at a hospital with an associated ortho program and what I did when I learned that I didn't match into orthopedics my fourth year of medical school. Stay tuned. I hope you enjoy what we have to show you. So let's just start by telling our stories. Andy, do you, I know you have an interesting family story, but why did you decide to do orthopedics? Well, um, as Emily said, my name is Andy Malarkey. I'm a fifth year resident in orthopedics and my story about how I got into orthopedics uh, probably could be traced back to my father who is also an orthopedic surgeon. So my first exposure to that particular field was mostly through going through rounds with him, uh, being able to view some of the surgeries that he was involved in and I grew to like it early on during my career. Uh, I will say that I kept my options open going to medical school I knew that I wanted to get involved in surgery, some sort of surgical field, uh, and I kept going back to orthopedics. I thought um, being able to work all over the body, uh, being to work with patients of uh, various age groups, uh, elderly patients as well as younger patients. And one thing in orthopedic surgery that makes it unique, at least in my opinion, is that uh, a lot of the procedures and surgeries you do for people, whether they're Either even including the non-operative treatment modalities, uh, people tend to get better, and I think that um, that's what probably drew me the most to, to orthopedics. How old were you when you first went to the office with your dad? The first real clinical exposures, I was in high school, uh, and then heading into college as well during my summer breaks. I was a nursing care uh, technician. Uh, for several years prior to going to medical school, uh, and that gave me some opportunity to even see him on the floor seeing post-operative patients as well. But uh, usually on the weekends, I'd be able to go and watch him fix the hip fractures and uh, cases like that, which kind of drew drew my attention initially to the to the field. So. so you took some time off between undergrad and medical school? I did. I actually took one year off um, before I went to Ohio University Medical School. And during that time, I worked in the emergency department at University of Kentucky, also as a nursing care uh, technician or a nursing assistant, depending on where you go. It's called different things. And uh, that gave me a great exposure to the field of emergency medicine, which for a short period of time, I thought would be where I'd go. But um, yeah, and it was, it was a great experience get to work with patients and at least being part of the, the medical team, I think was you know, drew me even more fond of medicine in general. So. Did your parents encourage you to become a doctor? You know, it's it's interesting because I actually come from a, a family a now. It's almost a family of doctors since my brother is also a resident and my younger brother is in medical school. But no, I, and they never, there was no pressure growing up, you know, needing to be a doctor. They they really allowed me it to. It just happened. It just happened. It just, and that's where I am today. And it's hard to believe, but. Uh, the, the the truth is I went to undergrad thinking I was going to get involved in law and I uh, did some political science classes and decided to go the other way. But regardless, but yeah, no, my parents were great. They were very supportive with whatever I decided to do. Uh, I will say it's hard when you have someone you truly look up to, like I look up to my father, um, and not be immersed and uh, intrigued by, you know, the field that he's involved in because such a, I had such high respect for him and still do uh, mm -hmm. that it was, it, it was very easy for me to gravitate towards medicine. Um, I saw the, how people treated him in the community. I saw all the things that he would do. And, and let's face it, a lot of the tools and instruments in orthopedics are just 
cool. And uh, <laughs> so it was, it, it was an easy decision for me ultimately, but I had nothing but support and I could do whatever I was happy with, I guess to say. What does your other brother do? So my other brother, he is a uh, second year vascular surgery resident in Pittsburgh and he's extremely busy. I think they arrive at orthopedics in terms of the amount of hours at the hospital, mm. uh, but he's very busy, and uh, his wife is an internal medicine uh, resident as well. They're busy, but enjoying it. And then my younger brother is a first-year med student, and he's uh, involved in that grind now, gross anatomy and immunology and all that good stuff. So, so when you were in his shoes, you said you knew you wanted to do surgery of some sort i would say yeah i mean looking back i mean obviously years have passed but i think the big thing i tell and i've told this to my brother as well and i've told this to other students i think if you can put yourself into a category of being more of the medicine tract versus being in a procedural field i think that's a important distinction to make and to make it early Mm -hmm. because i think that can at least you can focus and, and hone in on a particular area much easier if you decide that early. Uh, I'm not saying that some of these medicine-based uh, practices don't have procedures to them. That's that's not true, as you yeah. see, especially like cardiology. But I think if you look at your life, your career, and your future and decide, well, I'd like to be in the OR at least for a percentage of time in the office and the other, I think that's, you know, once you decide that early, mm-hmm. I think it can make uh, future decisions much easier. So, Thinking yeah. about how you want to practice. I think exactly. a lot of medical students don't have as much exposure to the other end of it, especially since you saw your dad and how he actually practiced. You could see how it translated into what you wanted to do. Exactly. How did you... Or when did you make the final decision to do ortho? I made the final decision in my third year, the beginning portion of my third year. And at that time, as I would said, I, I wanted to do something surgical. I thought about plastic surgery. I thought for a time about neurosurgery. Yeah. And those quickly went away after um, a little bit more exposure uh, to those fields. I knew it just didn't fit my personality. But I would say the third, the beginning part of my third year is when I really decided that orthopedics is where I wanted to go. And I've had no regrets ever since. I think it's uh, um, a great field. Now, with that being said, I, I'm interested in hand surgery. And there's a lot of plastic surgery um, principles and tenets involved yeah. in that. It's a little bit more of a delicate area of orthopedics. Uh-huh. Um, so I think I've cultivated that interest, at least in that plastic surgery realm of, of medicine. A little plastics, a yeah, little vascular. A little bit of everything. So, yeah, and I, I think that's that's one of the reasons why that particular field drew me more in was because it kind of encompassed all those things. So, so you were a student here, essentially. You were a core student here. Yeah. Ohio yes. University associated with Grandview Hospital. Yes. Once you made the decision to do ortho, like what changed or how did you first go about how did you approach it after you decided? So in the in the osteopathic world, uh, due to the – and I'm not – I can't give specifics on this, but they tend to send the students out to different hospitals, as you know, um, you know, different core hospitals that allow you to do your clinical rotations. I was fortunate enough to be a core student at a hospital they ended up being a resident at, which you know has had some advantages and disadvantages. And I think once I realized that I wanted to do orthopedics – there were many opportunities for me to be involved with the residency mm-hmm. at Grandview um, for a didactic portion of my uh, of experience. Uh, anytime I'd have opportunities to show up to the fracture conferences or the morning reports or the lectures that they'd have in the morning, I would I would try to incorporate that into my schedule mm-hmm. as long as it didn't jeopardize my experience in other rotations. So I was pretty diligent about doing that for most of my third year. I would say it kind of trailed off in my fourth year, but that was a way for me to, one, uh, have the residents know me, but also in, in a much broader perspective, get a increase my foundation of orthopedic knowledge. Did um, you feel awkward as a student walking into didactics with a bunch of residents? I think... Medicine in general has a lot of awkward moments, and I think you can speak to that as well. And I think as a student, when you're essentially the bottom of the totem pole in many respects, uh, there can be many awkward experiences. There were times, if if I'm honest with myself, I did feel a little bit awkward. Here you are, you're a young student, you're trying to 
figure a way out and you know in this world and, and orthopedics can be daunting in and of itself the yeah. fact that it's so competitive um there were times where i felt that way i will say the residents at grandview were always very welcoming uh-huh. uh, and very um encouraging of the educational component that you know that kind of once i actually found myself in the in the student's chair so yeah. to speak uh, i think a lot of that anxiety and that um you know uncertainty kind of wasn't such a big deal i think so. that's a that's a big thing for me when I was a student. That's a big hill to overcome. I think I was hesitant to do anything that I wasn't invited to do. I felt like I would be imposing or inconveniencing or just not following the rules or thinking that I'm better than other people if I were to just forge a path that wasn't explicitly there for students. But if you look at it from the flip side, how do we think about students who come into education now? It's not like, oh, well, how come they feel like they can be in our education? It's the complete opposite. We feel like they're investing in their education and doing, you know, traveling the world, the path less traveled. We feel like they have initiative rather than they're imposing on us. Yeah. That was a big flip for me when I was a student. I was too shy, I think, to do that kind of thing. Sure. And and I, and I will say that you can... And, and you've experienced this as well, that you'll see the spectrum of students. There are, there are many students that are very, I'm going to use the word aggressive, not in a bad yeah. sense of the word, but much more aggressive. Assertive. Term. Assertive. That's probably better. Uh, <laughs> that are willing to, to get in there and, you know, and, and, um, get the exposure that they think is the most important thing versus this, some that be a little bit more reserved. And I will say if, if, if I'm being honest, I was probably a little bit more reserved student. So some of the things that you're describing, I remember feeling. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I was I was using it as an opportunity to increase my orthopedic knowledge. Yeah. And it wasn't at a detriment of the my other rotations that I was on. And that's what made it so unique. The ortho guys started so early yeah. that I could get in, have an hour worth of orthopedic experience, and then at 7 o'clock, start rounding, start rounding for my other rotations. So... I think it really set me apart, uh, I think, moving forward from other students. Yeah. Uh, but I will say there was a part of me when there were other students on the service yeah. and I was a core student. Uh, believe it or not, I didn't want to feel like I was taken away from their experience since I was the, the known face, so uh-huh. to speak. Um, not saying that I'm, you know. Famous. Famous at all. My name is <laughs> still not, never will be. But I think um, – yeah, so certainly I, I, I understand. Being considerate of everybody else. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Okay. So. so that's where you were, third year. Fourth year, you started doing your sub-internship rotations. How did you pick where to go? So I think, you know, I think the big thing uh, for choosing rotations in these sub-internships a lot of it for me was a geography thing. Yeah. And, and I know that might not be the answer that – Everyone uses when they go through this process, but for me, you have to understand that I had a, had a you know, I was married, and um, uh, I chose uh, rotations based mostly on that, and some of it was coming from other residents, yeah, um, kind of guiding me. You need to check out this program. You need to check out this program. They've got a good reputation, so on and so forth. And then I, I would use, I'd use some of the advice that I would get from the residents to to go places. And I think. Combination of those things probably why I chose the few rotations that I get. Yeah. So you pretty much on. stayed in the Midwest. I stayed in the Midwest. And matter of fact, the, the only rotations that I went on were in the state of Ohio. Okay. Um, that's not to say I didn't apply to other schools or mm-hmm. residencies rather, but I, uh, those are, you know, I just stayed in Ohio during that time. So, which, you know, it made it easy for me. And if you look at the, you know, the osteopathic world, there are, I can't say how many residencies are in Ohio now, but there's probably a fair amount. More so than other states, yeah, I would think. I think this area is pretty, not saturated, but there are a lot of programs within driving distance. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, definitely. So, Did you do four-week rotations everywhere? I did some four-week rotations, but I also had some two-week rotations in there as well. Okay. I think I had one, I think I had one two-week rotation, which is not a lot of time. Yeah. Um, but it was enough time for me to get exposure to the program. And I think if you're a competitive applicant, I think it's enough time for you to, you know, for them to, you know, get a glimpse of what you would bring to the program, some certain attributes that 
uh, they're looking for, I think, can be seen in that amount of time. Yeah. I can't say from an overall educational experience it's the best. Yeah. Uh, because once you get settled in, essentially. you Once you get your login, basically, you're on to the next. You're on to the next place. And I'll say the same thing about residency. Some of the rotations that you feel like you're getting the hang of things, you move on to the next thing. And that's that's just part of the process. But, yeah. um, you know, for me, I think that. I think if you if you're a good applicant, I think you can get you can show programs what you're made of in those two weeks. But mm-hmm. you know, it's uh, every place is different. I don't know if they all require a certain amount of time, but um, for me, that's kind of how it works. So out. there's a lot of programs that'll say that you can do two to four weeks, but almost every program that I talked to said even though you can do two to four weeks, we would recommend doing four weeks. I echo what you're saying that. By good applicant, I think you mean that you're experienced and that you can pick things up quickly. If it takes you a week to get into the flow of work, then there goes half your rotation. But if you feel like you can pick up the flow in a couple days, then, you know, you could probably spread out your chances and do two-week rotations. So I think I did. I did a two-week rotation here when I was a student. I didn't get in the first time. I didn't come back either. But on my two-week rotation, this was my only two-week rotation. I think. So your rest of, the rest of the rotations you had were four weeks. Mm-hmm. I even had a three week one in there. Oh really? Yeah. You know, and, it, and it, you bring up good points too because I, I'm not entirely sure what the schools require. Yeah. I mean, some would say that if you could, if you have a certain a lot of time, let's say twelve weeks of elective time, does it make more sense to go to more programs for a short amount of time versus go to one program for a longer yeah. a longer period of time? And you know, and that that's a that's a question that I'm not sure I have a, have an answer to. I think it's very individual, just like what you were talking about. If you knowing yourself know that it takes you about a week to figure out where the bathroom is, what your login is, um, warm up to people to not be a robot, then you might be better suited to the long format rotation where you take a couple, maybe a week or two to warm up and then show people what you have in the remaining weeks. But if you're someone I don't know if I would categorize it as like good versus not as good, but like just your personality type, the way that you function. If you feel like you can pick up quickly, knowing that you have a shorter amount of time, that you'll probably have less face time, you'll probably meet less people. If you feel like that's a format that your personality shines, then maybe it's better to go for volume Mm -hmm. over time frame. Sure. Yeah. But yeah, that's a tough question that there's no blanket answer for. It's just know your strengths and see if that plays to it. Right. And I, yeah, and I think that like you, you know, I think that's a great point because, you know, it's going back to the awkward thing. Yeah. You know? So even if you're a course student at a certain site, it might be a little easier to walk in that orthopedic room in the morning. But yeah. I will say that, and this is not just in orthopedics, it's probably many areas of, of, of specialties, but um, you know, you walk into the room for the first time, meeting new people for the first time, finding a place to live, finding the best way to, even find scrubs. I mean, you talk about the things that most of us take for granted now, it could be a very stressful time for a student and, and and everybody's different and everybody's different, how comfortable they are meeting people the first time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think taking that into consideration, I think is probably a good thing moving forward with how to allocate your elective time. So, which is actually a little bit of a side from your story is I think one of the biggest things that you can learn to do as a third year once you start clinical rotations is to learn to pick up quickly, like on any of your rotations, if you practice getting into the workflow within the first couple of days, that is a skill that will translate to your sub internship rotations on ortho. If you can figure out where things are the first couple of days, you're in a hospital for your internal medicine rotation that will help you find the scrubs when you mm-hmm go on your ortho sub internship rotation. Right. If you know how to dial the operator and what to ask for when you dial the operator, that can make a big difference between a student who has to wait for everything to be handed to them and someone who can actually function on their own. And don't be afraid to ask questions. Yes. You know, and and we've all been there and I think in medicine in general sometimes the is just forgotten from the top down. Uh, so we've all been in this situation of, you know, you're in a new position, you're the new person, but don't be afraid to ask questions and, and, 
get the most that you can out of each one of these experiences, like you said, because you'd be surprised how experience in cardiology might help you out in, in orthopedic surgery. Just mm-hmm. maybe just giving you a little bit more confidence to ask a question or, uh, you know, kind of take yourself out of your comfort zone. Cause that, that's going to be something, especially when you're competing for a, you know, for a, a specialty such as orthopedics, you're going to need to be successful. So I think one of the big skills too, that like make people stand out is your ability to lateralize, take a skill that you picked up somewhere and be able to apply it in a different field. A hospital is a huge system where all these moving parts happen. If you can figure out how a hospital runs on your other rotations, it will translate directly to how how well you're able to function on orthopedics. Right. I think a lot of students tend to like focus all their efforts on learning fracture classifications and how to put on splints and all this stuff. But really, if you can understand how a hospital runs and like pick up little things about like, oh, this dosing matters because of this, because nurses like this or doctors like that, you know, you can start to think laterally and then those sorts of things will translate, I think, as strangely enough, maturity or having a big picture view of what this entire field of medicine is, not just how do I be a good orthopedic student. All right. So you did all your sub-internship rotations. You interviewed here. You matched here um i didn't realize how long you've been here <laughs> i've been here for so long that they're thinking about putting my picture on the grandview hall of fame <laughs> oh, but no i've been you here you live like i you grew up I, it's like my second an hour away it's like exactly so this is like my old stomping ground so i uh you know it's funny is that i, I grew up about north of where we currently are for about 45 minutes but i'm well you know, I've always been familiar with the the Dayton area, so it's it was an easy transition for me. There's something to being close to home, yeah, uh, for me that uh, made things a lot easier. And now, you know, where I am in my life now, it's even more so the case. But yeah, certainly, if I look back, I, this is going to be my my ninth year mm-hmm. at the Grandview Hospital. So um, yeah, it's a long time. <laughs> so hopefully, I've made my mark. Whether good or bad, but yeah, it's hard to believe. And that's another thing that's always surprises me is how fast the time goes. You know, yeah, I, I can, I can, you know, you bring these questions up and me, you know, recalling my story. It's it's hard to believe that that was you know six seven years ago. Mm-hmm. You know, where I was thinking of these things that a lot of the questions that at least I had, I know students continue to have a lot of the concerns that I had. I know that my brother will have and current students have and will continue to have for, you know, years to come. So it's, um, I think there's a lot of value going back and looking at how I felt because I think it's a, it gives me a little bit more perspective to understand how students feel. Yeah. I mean, it was the beginning of, uh, of sub intern third and fourth year. It was a huge emotional roller coaster. And I think that that transition from classroom education to getting thrown into clinical on the fly education is kind of a rough transition at times. We take it for granted that all these people who are super smart and who are professional learners, professional students, I would say, professional students and swap them into professional professionals that mm-hmm. learn in a professional system, you no longer sit there and have lectures given to you. And then regurgitated on a test now you have to somehow figure out how to learn it on your own and that transition i think gets glossed over a lot Mm -hmm. that transition from being a student and then trying to get a job being a resident it's just it's a good thing to reflect on very emotional roller coaster yeah yeah for sure i mean that's and that's part of it it's part of the process and i think it's part of you know talking to many people about this and, you know, us sitting here and and talking about this. I think a lot of the reservations that we had and, you know, all these emotions, it's not, you know, it's not unique. It's definitely, we've been there and uh, now we can see it from the other side, at least moving forward (laughs) or just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So, so my story is a little bit different. I, well, there's actually a lot of similarities and some differences. So I also went to medical school. 
um, wanting to do something surgical. I wanted to do plastic surgery. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe we're in the wrong field. You ever think about that? <laughs> plastic. So what drew you to plastic surgery, though? So I grew up um, as an artist. I think I just wasn't brave enough to try to do art as a living. So I thought I'd be a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That makes sense. <laughs> Um, I was always really good with my hands and I always did things like construction and art and crafts and things like that. I also like science. So my dad was a scientist and my mom was a musician. I thought I'd try to do something that was kind of the mix of the two. Yeah, kind of combine them. Yeah. So to speak. Yeah. So that's where I went into medicine thinking that I would do plastic surgery. Um, and actually even until, Later, maybe third year, I was still thinking plastic surgery. Well, what made what was your tipping point into the field of orthopedics versus yeah versus that? In undergrad, I didn't have any exposure to ortho. Um, I did have some plastic exposure just because I looked for it, but I didn't actually see any orthopedic surgery before I went to medical school, and our ortho club on campus was the only one that really had. A surgical shadowing opportunity. So I went to shadow the orthopedic program associated with my school, the Riverside program, just because I wanted to be in the OR as a medical student. And I saw surgery and it made total sense. It was a very structural, like spatial orientation kind of person. And it really meshed with all the construction and building I did as a kid. And so it just seemed to make sense. And I wanted to do something kind of sounds lazy, but I wanted to do something that I didn't really have to compute in my mind. I wanted to do something that was intuitive, that after, clearly it's going to take a while to learn, but after I learn it, it's going to make intuitive sense. Intuitive as in it plays to my strengths, plays to the way that my mind works. So broken bone, fix it? Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, wow. Well, there's some stereotypes that are true, but there's, you know. (laughs) There is much more orthopedics, as you know, than that. But, yeah, yeah okay. So, um, and then for your – how many sub-internships and how many rotational experiences did you have in orthopedics prior to, you know, match and the first time around? My school was a little more liberal with how many you can do. They give you a certain time frame. I was able to fit five in. And – Unlike you, I didn't really have any geographic restraints. So I was married at the time, but um, my husband was very mobile. We didn't really have any ties to any area. So I was really haphazard, I think, in the way that I picked where to rotate. I had two on the West Coast, one on the East Coast, a couple in the middle. I was all over the place. And basically, I chose based on word of mouth or orthogate, or what I read, it it was very emotional, not calculated at all. Um, And then somehow I threw together my list of places, and I did my rotation. I did feel a lot of the awkwardness that you were talking about. I felt like I was late to the game because I didn't really pick up on ortho until later. My dad is not an orthopedic surgeon, so this is a completely different world (laughs) from what uh, I had exposure to. So it was a lot of learning on the fly. And Andy mentioned the first time around because I did not match my first time. So I did all my audition, sub-internship rotations. I um, interviewed nearly everywhere that I rotated. And then I didn't match. I want to I get back to the – because I think it's important. And I think you've been pretty transparent about it, about the not matching. But you had mentioned something – going through the process. And I said the same thing as word of mouth Mm -hmm. and that, as we've known now currently might not be the best thing. Yeah. Uh, You hear certain things about programs that may or may not be true. And I think that can be frustrating for both the potential resident as well as the current residents. Then you also mentioned a website, which, you know, my understanding, there's some stuff that on there is just outdated. Yeah. Um, Were those the only two ways that you could determine Pretty much. Go to place? Okay. Yeah. When I look back on it um, from both sides, from the student side, it was, I have no idea how to choose. I'm just going to ask everybody I come across, which program should I go to? And some people would talk about, I mean, basically that's all you can go off of their own experience because 
you go through as a student, but you only become a resident in one place. So you only get real exposure and understanding of your program. So I think there was a, a real lack of information there. And the caveat to that whole thing is that the culture or the maybe the subculture of a residency can change very, very quickly. So when I was rotating, I um, almost canceled my Grandview rotation because someone told me that it was a malignant program. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah, And and I don't remember who it was or if they were qualified to tell me that, or I don't remember any of the details except that it was very random. And these sort of things just are, are said. Mm -hmm. And I considered canceling my rotation. It's interesting. And I, and I, and I, I, would be lying to say if I haven't heard these certain attributes to programs, mm-hmm. which, like I said before, may or may not be true. Um, and I think in the osteopathic world, it, that can be a challenge for for many students because you want the best experience and the best training, but you don't want it at the expense of you know being quote unquote abused. And on the same token, if you look at the the allopathic way of going through programs, there may or may not have a lot of elected time for sub internships, but largely it's based on reputations, which seems to be much more readily transparent than the osteopathic world. Now, whether that may or that may or may not be true, I'm not entirely sh- certain about that. But I think um, I think if there was a means or a way for students to become more aware mm-hmm. of, of 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 programs and at least what they have to offer. Because um, there's no doubt, and this is nothing that's unique about our program or any other program, is that some some programs have strengths and some programs have weaknesses. Mm-hmm. And um, in, in going through the process, I, I, I see that now. Um, and I, I think it's it's just interesting. It's always interesting when I hear and I even look back on how, when I was going through the process, you hear and hear what students say now, what they think of your program yep. prior to them arriving. And yep. you're like, well, that's not true. I'm not sure what you're talking about, you know. So I think that touches on a big topic issue way of thinking about. There are different types of cultures. If you think about them as different cultures, it's not an objective better or worse. It's just what sort of value everyone pretty much has the same values. We want to produce competent, good surgeons, right? It's just how do you interpret these values into the way that your program is run. So, for example, if there is a program that is very collectivist, they expect everyone to be on the same page at the same time. If someone doesn't get along with that particular type of running a program, I could see how they would think that that's malignant. If you're being asked all the time, what did you do there? What did you do there? What did you Mm -hmm. like? What did you do with that patient? Like, did you tell me? Did you update me on that patient? It really depends on your personality, how you're going to see that. Do you see that as malignant or do you see that as lots of oversight and backup? Mm -hmm. So that's something to dig into more in the future. I don't know exactly how we'll do that, but. Sure. And I, and I I think, and it also can be said that certain students have gone through programs and it may or may not been turned out the way they wanted it to. Yeah. And, and a lot of the stuff that you'd read on the website, uh, I hate to, to say it might, one might not be true, and it's probably unprofessional mm-hmm. to be writing in certain ways, in certain respects. But um, so for you, so you, you went through this process. So you're on this emotional roller coaster, of you, as you've mentioned, and and it is. So you you go through this match day, and the match day happens, and then and then what? You don't you don't match. Yeah. What, what what were your initial thoughts? What are your initial feelings? Um, I mean, was there any part of you that said, you know what, this is this is not worth it or, you know, take us kind of through that, that, that part of your life. I kind of had an idea that I may not match. I think talking to a lot of um, the people I was rotating with, they were getting good feedback. I had gotten some feedback. I had not gotten any bad feedback, but I hadn't gotten any great feedback. And so I knew that I had to either bury my head in the sand and just hope that I matched on match day, or I had to start looking at alternatives. It was not easy to find information on the alternatives. I feel like I was 
had an overly optimistic view of what a transitional year or a traditional rotating year could do. In my mind, I thought that I would go to a traditional rotating internship, I'd do a year of internship, and then I'd magically find a second year spot somewhere. And so I guess I was devastated because I didn't match, but I was probably naively optimistic that I would just do an internship year. And then everything would fall into place. Everything would fall into place. You did a traditional rotating internship, mm-hmm. which probably encompassed a variety of different. Yeah. At this point, you know, I mean, we should state this: you you'd graduated, mm-hmm. you were a physician, yeah, and you had a set rotation schedule for that year. And if that's the case, did you find time during that time to do any more orthopedic rotations, or is it all at this point more self directed learning in terms of orthopedics? That's where. I was extremely lucky. So one of my favorite quotes is luck favors the prepared, but this is definitely an area in my life where luck played a big role. Having not looked into the different types of rotating internships, somehow I ended up at a traditional rotating internship that lined up with my goals. I hadn't researched it. It just happened that they had a spot and I called and somehow ended up in that program. With that being said, not all traditional rotating internships are created equal. Like I say that over and over in the blog, because I know that a lot of classmates who went on to do traditional rotating internships and ran into exactly the same problem, the problems that you're alluding to that once you are an intern, this is a job you are required to show up to your job. Mm -hmm. And there are rules that are specific to each program I could have ended up at a internship that required me to be there all the time that required me to be on call so much so that I wouldn't have enough energy left over to do a good application that would not have let me go out and do my sub internship rotations again, because unfortunately in the ortho ortho world, sometimes out of sight, out of mind, people very quickly forget about you if um, they don't see or hear from you in a while. My internship had a couple of factors that I feel like are really important. One is that it had a reasonable schedule. So I had enough sleep to be able to um, read ortho and work on my application, work on my personal statement and develop myself as a person without being extremely tired. Two, it was near a ortho program. So it wasn't at um, PCOM's home program where all their interns do their internship, but it was at a hospital affiliated with them. So in the same city as PCOM, so I was able to go to their didactics most of the time when it um, didn't conflict with my schedule. I was able to work with them in the hospital. In that regards, I was able to stay ingrained in ortho a little bit during that year. And three, they allowed me to have elective rotations. So I was actually able to do away rotations as an intern well, that's that's nice. Yeah, be able to do that. How many weeks would you say that you had time? So for? my program allowed me three months. Wow, of okay. away rotations. I ended up going to a program that I hadn't been to before, and a program and an official one with uh, PCOM. Okay, and I used my third one, which I also think is important to do a rotation in anesthesia. I think during intern year, I was starting to realize that this was not an easy or a guaranteed root into ortho and that I had to figure out what else in life I would be happy doing. And so I spent one of those audition rotations or sub internship rotations, uh, doing anesthesia, which I actually liked a lot too. So you took advantage of the, of the situation with your time. So you're saying that that would be something you were willing to explore if ortho didn't work out again, or is it something that you thought would benefit you being an applicant the second time around? So anesthesia is unique. Well, not unique, but it's special in that it requires, some programs required you to do an internship separate. It's not integrated. Um, My internship would have counted towards that first year of anesthesia. Logistically, that's why I looked at it. But also I liked it as a field. So I applied to both during my intern year. So while I applied to orthopedics the second time around, I also put in all my applications for anesthesia. So I interviewed for both. Okay. Did you find that you went through the interview process again? Did you interview at many of the same places? Were some of them new? 
were you more open to going to more interviews this time around? Um, how did the second interview experience go for you? Interviewing or applying as an intern, you have a big red flag. I called every single program to see if they would consider me as an applicant, seeing as I'm an intern, and most of them said no. I only got That's interesting. three interviews. Would you say that's because, I mean, is there something about maybe enrolling as a second year or were you, you were willing to do yes. another intern year again, mm-hmm. right? If yeah. Took, right. Okay. I could probably explore this a little bit more, but the blanket answer I got is that there are so many qualified, great applicants that don't have the baggage of being, having done an extra year mm-hmm. that they don't have to. So they're going to pick from their pool of students. Okay. The three places that I did interview, two of them I had done rotations at during that year. And then the third one was Grandview, which I had rotated at the previous the year previous as a student. Year. Okay. Did you feel like going through the interview process a second time was easier in some ways, harder than others, or much harder just because now it's your second time around and if it didn't work out for you this time, then it'd be that much more discouraging? How did you feel going through the process or would you just treat it as a... Another day at work. (laughs) Well, it was harder and easier. I think as a fourth year student, I was very tunnel visioned. It was like, I'm going to do ortho. That's all I can imagine my life being. Second time around, mindset was more like, I'm a doctor. I am going to find a field where I can make a difference and I will be good at and I will be happy. Whether it's ortho or anesthesia, we'll see. But at the same time, I had invested a whole nother year sure. in trying to do ortho. So there was, there was another roller coaster. There was a exactly. lot of ups. <laughs> a lot of ups and downs. And downs, yeah. That is a roller coaster. Yeah, and, I, and I think going through that part, process of not matching and matching, I think, I think you, and you would like to get your perspective, probably learn so much about yourself and learn so much about medicine during that year yeah. that – would you say that it was worth it doing that? I mean, would you say that in the end it was kind of a blessing in disguise in Absolutely. certain respects? Okay. Yeah. So I kind of talked a little bit about how I was very shy and um, how difficult it was for me to walk into a room that I wasn't invited into. Um, I was stuck, I think, in that format of I have signed up for this class. You're going to give me the curriculum. I'm going to read everything on the, um, that you give me. And then when you tell me the test is, I will tell you what I've learned. Mm -hmm. And that is not the format at all. And I was stuck in that format where I was having a difficult time forging my own path. When I couldn't get in with the formula, basically that you learn to get in, I had to restart, refigure it out. And I think that I identified several things that were holding me back, one being my shyness and my inability to push almost or to forge my path. During intern year, I learned to ask questions. I learned to think about what I wanted and uh, how to find people to help me. That was another big thing. I Mm -hmm. didn't like to ask for help. So it was like, you know, if you're given a reading list, you just read the list, right? You don't ask people for help or I didn't in undergrad Mm -hmm. and in medical school, but now you're not going to be able to do everything on your own. You have to make relationships. You have to find mentors. You have to find, you have to bounce ideas off of people. And I think that helps develop who you're going to be. Mm -hmm. That's, that's very true. And I I think the big picture thing here too, is that we talk about, I mean, these are, this is your career. These are very important things, but I think, at least what you're describing to me can you can extrapolate to other areas of life as well. So I think it was a year for you to to grow and learn more about yourself, and that's something that you can take with you, you know, yeah. forever, and uh, definitely in your professional life too, but in other areas as well. So I feel like my feelings about the it, to first interview and second interview were very different and mixed. But you heard my first and second interview. Did you feel like there was a difference? I I would say that, and I don't say this about a, a lot of interviews that I've been through, but I would say your interview, I I distinctively remember a few comments that you made. And I can't say that about even interviewees this past year, but uh, it seemed that the second time around you were much more confident 
and um, sure of yourself, and and you know whether you actually felt that way or just conveyed <laughs> it, uh, you seem much more of a, a confident uh, applicant. And I think ultimately, I think that confidence and and, and um, you've turned out to be an excellent resident. And I, I think that I think that that's that's something I distinctly remember. And I can't remember exactly what you said. I think it was something about what made you different this this time around or something mm-hmm. to that effect. Um, and I remember sitting there like, I can't believe she just said that in the middle of an interview. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it worked. <laughs> but it, but to me, it was, you know, it's one thing to be rejected from something. And there's plenty of people that were in your position who decided to do something else or yeah. already had a backup plan. Yeah. And you probably know some of these people. Mm-hmm. I've talked to these people. And I always it always bothered me when – and we would ask students, well, if you didn't match, what would you do? Yeah. And and it's and it would always bother me when students would come back and say, well, I would do this. Something completely separate than what they're interviewing for. Mm-hmm. And while it's great to have a backup plan in life in general, yeah. for whatever reason it is, I also think it's also, you know, if it's something you truly want to do and are truly passionate about, if orthopedics is what you want to do, mm-hmm. then saying, listen, I'm going to gear up and I'm going to beef up my application and in your situation you know you get a little bit more confident a few things change here and there then you know, just make yourself a better applicant and try again mm-hmm. now if this went on for three or four years certainly i would understand maybe doing something else but i admire people such as yourself who you know these, these are some of like the biggest decisions of your life if you think about it, like your professional goals and dreams and it got shot down for you the that one time but you know look at you now now you're a second year resident in a, in a great program and you're going to be a full fledged doctor here in a few years. And I, I think that's, I think that's, yeah, I think you know, if you want something bad enough, you'll, you'll try again. And I think that, yeah, I just, I remember going through the process with you. It, it just seemed like it was, I would say probably the biggest thing was confidence, confidence in how you approach the interview, confidence in our, uh, in our process that we have when we're looking at applicants and, you know, yeah, for me, it was an easy choice to be behind you. Well, that's our episode for this week. Thanks for listening, and if you enjoyed it, please subscribe and leave us a review. Make sure to check out the website at whitecoatcoaching.com, where you'll find all the show notes and what else we have to offer, including the Osteopathic Ortho Residency Guide to help you research where to rotate, and links to follow us on social media for more x-ray readings and videos and the like. Thanks again, and until next time, take care.